Lagos State High Court sitting at the Tafabalewa Square, Lagos Island, has convicted and sentenced to death by hanging a suspended assistant superintendent of police, Drambi Vandi, for the murder of Mrs. Omobolanle Rahim, a 41 year old pregnant lawyer at the Aja Underbridge checkpoint on December. 25, 2022. Justice Ibiron Ke Arisin held that the prosecution, the Lagos State Government, has proven the case against the convict beyond all reasonable doubt. The court found the defendant guilty on one count of murder and sentenced Drambi Vandi to death by hanging. Joining me to discuss this and cite various lessons to law enforcement operatives is Liboros Oshama, legal practitioner and human rights activist. Welcome to Plus Politics, Barrister. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, my friend and brother, uh, Malawa. Uh, mm, is a is a very sobering case. Uh, a life was lost. Another life has been sentenced to to death. Although he has rights of appeal, and there are, there are still two levels of appellate courts that he could he could uh, approach. But it's all sad story. What's your take of this? Your cursory review of this case before we go into the specifics of the lessons that uh, law yeah. enforcement officers um, ought to learn from this? Yeah, quickly, um, two things comes to mind, um, came to my mind immediately. I heard about this judgment. Um, the first was um, the case of Ugozi against the states. Um, for lawyers, uh, they will remember this, a young man who was traveling from Lagos to Benin and um, at a checkpoint somewhere around Okada, uh, police accosted him. And, um, you know, I don't know the argument that ensued subsequently about um, money settlement or not. And he was shot point blank. And the man died immediately. And the defense of um, the police then was that um, the man was um, struggling the rifle with the police officer on duty or the man at the point checkpoint. But it took the intervention of um, the ballistic experts who examined the body um, to testify to the fact that this um, bullet wound was not as a result of scruffle, but a bullet wound that was shot, that was fired at, at close range at the disease. And um, uh, the matter was um, appealed up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court affirmed both the judgment of um, the, you know, two lower courts. Uh, that's the first thing that came to my mind. And the um, second thing was the fact that in this case, I had wished that my friend Ugo, um, who also died, you know, in questionable circumstances in the hands of policemen, you know, sometimes a week or a few days after his wedding some years ago, also I wish he had gotten, you know, this kind of justice. His family probably would have celebrated and then, um, you know, would have been very happy. Sisters would have been very happy. And then, so for this, I am also, you know, um, happy that um, the Lagos state government took up this matter and um, saw to the conclusion of prosecution, investigation and prosecution. And then um, that, you know, also gave a lot of hope to people who, you know, matters, similar issues that happened to that there's indeed light at the end of the tunnel and also it will send a strong signal to, you know, trigger her. Hello? Of uh, abusing, you know, their, their, their powers and office. Uh, uh, Barrister Shama, I must ask this question. I know that you are a human rights uh, activist and you, I know some of the sacrifices you've made to protect the rights of individuals in the country, but 
I am also looking at the fact that cases like this, especially in the backdrop of the sobriety that overwhelmed uh, the police after answers, cases like this may also want to make some police operatives to feel, you know what, I, I may just be putting my life, you know, uh, head or tail or uh, head or tail, I may just be putting my life at risk because if things like this happen, I may be convicted. What would you want to tell an average policeman who is watching this program, who may not be trigger happy, but who also may have seen circumstances where some of these antiquated uh, guns that they give them uh, go, go gaga on their own. What would you want to tell that policeman? First and foremost, um, um, Bola, if you notice, if you see an army man uh, on the checkpoint and a policeman on the checkpoint, if you observe, uh, even the policeman, if you see the way a mobile policeman handles his gun and the way a normal policeman, the one with black uniform, handles their gun, and the way I, an army man handles his gun, his rifle, at the checkpoint, you notice, if you have observed, there are differences. There are difference the way they all handle their gun. That's professionalism. Um, no matter how antiquated these guns are, there are professional ways of handling these guns. So a policeman who is trained, properly trained, and who abides by the rules of um, uh, firearms, I do not think that the antiquated, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, firearm can just go ballistic on them. And even if it does, you will see the effort of the state to also investigate the matter. And, you know, at the end of the day, the policeman might be punished for being negligent in handling his equipment or his uh, rifle, but it will not go this far. But a situation where, what so, so that we don't have a situation where policemen will hide under the fact that, yes, you know, I handled it properly, but it just went ballistic on me, uh, and then be trigger happy. Recently, I had cause to campaign or, or, or um, submit a report against the attitude of some policemen on that same lucky as is where they just enter hire a van an unregistered van and then patrol that as is and begin to fleece innocent you know young people of their hard-earned money and then this um, lady you know fortunately she, she was a lawyer also was one of them one of such on a christmas day so and then this idea of checkpoints you are at gunpoint, you have a gun at checkpoint, it's not properly handled. So all of these things are the training and retraining that the police should ensure that their men go through. And like I, like, like, like I have said in, in initially, the idea of, you know, the um, rifle going ballistic, it, it's uncalled for, really, because if there are professionalism, is professionalism is held to the highest extent. Yes, mistake will happen, but it will be very, very minimal. Let me also give you an instance. There are situations where you see a policeman as early as 6 a.m., a policeman on duty at a checkpoint is reeking of alcohol. In such situations, it's quite unfortunate. Like, that's why also I would also commend the effort of the police at not hiding, you know, this one or, or trying to throw up unnecessary defense. defense you know, in the will of, of, of uh, justice. Because you find we've seen situations over time where these things happen, and then the police will say that um, the gun, you know, went off on its own, or that in some cases, because the person in question would have died, the disease, you know, was struggling a gun with, um, with um, uh, the uh, accused person, or that... There was a time, it was a recurring word, accidental discharge. Accidental discharge became a recurring defense for police. But unfortunately, I also want to commend the police of today, thanks also to social media, that the police did not hide on that accidental discharge to sweep this also under the carpet. Uh, and yes, we can say, even though, you know, this will not bring back the life of the disease, but at least justice 
to the family, justice to the unborn child, justice to the husband, justice also to the society, that people who are saddled with responsibility of protecting others should not at will, you know, uh, no matter the provocation, you take the life of, of people they are meant to protect. What would, you, protect. What would you want to uh, tell other uh, public prosecution departments in other states of the Federation and at the, and at the federal level, given the forensic nature of how the Lagos State Public Prosecution Department went about this case, got a ballistic expert, got witnesses, got pathologists. And I was, when I was reading the details of it, and I was thinking, hmm, some of these states where you can even see a barely functional public prosecution department, would they be able to do something as detailed than this? And would, if places were to be swapped, I don't want to mention some states now, would uh, an ASP or suspended ASP Vandy find himself where he is now? Yeah, but, um, but I, I tell you that when the police wants to walk, they walk. Also, uh, the case I started cited before, Ugozi and the state, that happened in Edo State. Also, ballistic uh, experts were, were employed to carry out a forensic analysis of the body, a forensic analysis of the equipment used, and prosecution was conducted detailing. What we see happening in our society, you, you remember those days we had, every state had a robust minister of justice, you know, that would carry out, um, you know, uh, all of these uh, investigations and prosecution. Are you there? You know, corruption had crept so detailed into the fabrics of our society uh, corruption crept so detail into the fabrics of our society that you know it now seems as if you know minor cases that ordinarily should you know even um, a new a new wig should ordinarily prosecute if, you know you will find state government wanting um at the federal level they would have probably have capacity to do much of this but uh, my call would be to the state government and to the local government you can imagine if this were left in the hands of, um, you know, a local government prosecuting agency. Uh, sorry, a local government um, chairman, for example, to, to investigate, if not for the intervention of a state government and then, you know, the Minister of Justice. I'm not a lawyer, but I want to believe that the, uh, the power of investigation essentially are federal in nature because the police is... The federal agency, but the power of prosecution resides with the state, as the, uh, the state yeah. public prosecution department. Yeah, it, it would ordinarily, it would ordinarily have not uh, a, a, a local government chairman would ordinarily have had nothing to do with a case like this. No, 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 no. But like what I am saying about local government chairman, for example, you know, this thing happens at the local government level everywhere. Is delineated into local government, uh, just like you have in, um, in in America and in the UK, where the office of the district attorneys, the office of the district attorney, take up prosecution. Event happens at the local government. It is for the local government to liaise with the DPO in that area to ensure that the prosecution is thorough, even before taking it to the state uh, level. The investigation before is reporting the matter. That yeah, the investigation, sorry, investigation is, is thorough. thorough. Okay. Yes, investigation is thorough. Before even taking it to the state level, where the Minister of Justice can begin to liaise with, you know, the investigating uh, uh, department. But in this case, but you will agree with me. But you will agree with me that in our dystopic fed, uh, federation, <laughs> the even the agency that will do the that will do the investigation or the force that will do the investigation. Is an exclusive federal force. That's the police. Yes, it's, that's what I'm saying. But being an exclusive federal force, but that's, they operate within within the realms of society. They also operate within local government areas. And these events happen at the local government area. You see where the state governors donate vehicles 
to police. You see where local government chairmen also donate CNRs, vehicles, to police. So what I am saying is, if you have, yes, if every, every state government that is serious should be able to take up investigation or prosecution of, of uh, uh, this nature. But we should also empower our local governments to be able to be a first, the first line of charge to liaise with the, uh, 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 the, the DPO Barista, to ensure Barista Shoma. investigation. Ba That's what I'm basically saying. Ba Barista Shoma, uh, you don't want to know how some local government uh, function <laughs> <laughs> in some states and federation, they only open the local government offices the day money will arrive from Jack. And as, <laughs> as soon as, uh, how, how do you want to wrap up how do you want to wrap up this so that, um, okay, I, I would you, want to you, wrap you up. See, you see, um, um, uh, but I, like I said, that's why, because of the dyscopic and dysfunctional nature of our local government, that is why I'm saying that the needs, we need to empower them. But in wrapping up, really, I think that um, uh, this is just a drop of so many that have happened across the Federation and then um, I will call on not just the state government, including the police, to also ensure that there is inherent discipline within the force that matters such as this. Not until somebody dies, the issue of training and retraining of the police should be paramount. The issue of training of um, how to handle firearms should be paramount. And then there should be consequences for action, whether rightly or wrongly. People who have a cell should be compensated and those people who are bad eggs in the force also should be fished out and punished. And there should be consequences for action. So with that, that is how we grow society. A society without obedience and observance to the rule of law can never be taken serious by anybody, be it within Thank you or without. Much. Thank you very much, Barista Libro Soshama, legal practitioner. Uh, uh, we are quite very grateful for your contribution this evening uh, thank you. I really want to say this before we wrap up, that we know that many of the men in uniform, police and other agencies, even in the intelligence community out there, we celebrate you. We know that you put in your life to defend us. It's only the bad eggs that we want to enjoy, uh, enjoy at this juncture to please. Think of their own families. What has happened to Van now will rub off negatively on his immediate family and his relations. We wish him the very best. Thank you, Barista Shama. Thank you, my pleasure always. And true. Thank you. Throwback Nigeria. Today's throwback. George Tubman Goldie the man whose 19th century business idea became Nigeria. Sir George Dashwood Tubman Goldie, KCMGFRS, 20 May 1846 to 20 August 1925, was an entrepreneur who bore the business vision for more than 20 years and ultimately championed the founding of the entity which ultimately gained infamy as the Royal Niger Company, the commercial enterprise which the British government bought over to institutionalize the colonization on the 1st of January 1900 of the geographical areas, with the colony of Lagos and other territories later collectively called the Southern and Northern Protectorates, and in 1914 were amalgamated to birth the political phenomenon known as Nigeria. In many ways, his role was similar to that of Cecil Rhodes in the southern region of Africa, but he refrained from self-publicity like Cecil Rhodes. George Goldie descended from an old Scottish family, born at the Nunnery, Douglas in Isle of Man, the youngest son of Lieutenant Colonel John Tubman Goldie Tubman, Speaker of the House of Keys by his second wife, Caroline Hevarina, daughter of John Hicken Hovendin, a barrister of Hemingford Gray. Orton Doshia, 
Sir George resumed his partner name, Goldie, by royal license in 1887. He was educated at the Royal Military Academy, Woolwich, the London neighborhood where journalist Flora Shaw, who later married Lord Lugard, and was credited to have christened Nigeria, hence the rumor that she first had a dalliance with George Goldie. For about two years, Goldie held a commission in the Royal Engineers, but usually for the time, Goldie was a convinced atheist to think that a country like Nigeria was actually birthed by an atheist or oh, Marshall. In 1870, he married Matilda, later known as Bone, Catherine's daughter of John William Elliot of Wakefield. He traveled in all parts of Africa, gaining an extensive knowledge of the continent and first visited the country for, of the Niger in 1877. He conceived the idea of adding to the British Empire the then little known re regions of the lower and middle Niger. And for over 20 years, his efforts were devoted to the realization of this conception. The method by which he determined to work was the revival of government by chartered companies within the empire, a method supposed to be buried with the British East India Company. The first step was to combine all British commercial interests in the Niger, and this he accomplished in 1879, when the United African Company was formed. In 1881, Goldie sought a charter from Glaston's government. Objections of various kinds were raised. To meet them, the capital of the company, renamed the National African Company, was increased from 250,000 pounds to one million pounds, and great energy was displayed in founding stations on the Niger. At this time, French traders, encouraged by Leon Gambetta, established themselves on the lower river, thus rendering it difficult for the company to obtain territorial rights. But the French men were bought out in 1884, so that at the Berlin Conference on West Africa in 1885, Goldie, present as an expert on matters relating to the river, was able to announce that on the lower Niger, the British flag was alone a few. Meantime, the Niger coast line had been placed under British protection through Joseph Thompson, David McIntosh, D.W. Sergeant, J. Flynn, William Wallace, E. Dangerfield, and numerous other agents. Over 400 political treaties were drawn up by Goldie, were made with the chiefs of the Lower Niger and the Alsa states. The scruples of the British government being overcome, a charter was at length granted July 1886, the National African Company becoming the Royal Niger Company with Henry Austin Bruce, first Baron Abidjan as governor and Goldie as vice governor. In 1895, on Lord Aberdeen's death, Goldie became governor of the company whose destinies he had guided throughout. The building up of Nigeria as a British state had to be carried on in face of further difficulties raised by French travelers with political mission and also in face of German opposition. From 1884 to 1890, Otto von Bismarck was a persistent antagonist, and the strenuous efforts he made to secure for Germany the basin of the Lower Niger and Nature were even more dangerous to Goldie's schemes of empire than the ambitions of France. Edward Robert Fletcher, who had traveled in Nigeria during 1882 to 1884 under the auspices of the British company, was sent out in 1885 by the newly formed German Colonial Society to secure treaties for Germany, which had established itself at Cameroon. After Fledger's death in, 18, death in 1886, his work was continued by his companion, Dr. Studdinger, while Air uh, Honisberg was dispatched to stir up trouble in the occupied portions of the company's territory, or, as he expressed it, to bust up the charter. He was finally arrested at Onicha, and after trial by the company's Supreme Court at Asaba, was expelled from the country. 
Bismarck then sent out his nephew, Herr von Puttmacher, as German consul to Nigeria with orders to report to, to this affair. And when this report was published in the White Book, Bismarck demanded every damages from the company. Meanwhile, Bismarck maintained constant pressure on the British government to compel the Royal Niger Company to a division of spheres of influence whereby Great Britain would have lost a third and the most valuable part of the company's territory. But he fell from power in March 1890 and in July, following Robert Gascoigne Cecil, Todd McHugh of Salisbury concluded the Eligoland Zanzibar Treaty with Germany. The aggressive action of Germany in Nigeria entirely ceased, and the door was opened for a final settlement. Nigeria, Cameroon, frontiers. These negotiations, which resulted in agreement in 1893, were initiated by Goldie as a means of arresting the advance of France into Nigeria from the direction of the Congo by, by, by conceding to Germany a long but narrow strip of territory between Adamawa and Le Chad, to which he had no treaty claims. A barrier was raised against French expeditions, semi-military and semi-exploratory, which sought to enter Nigeria from the east. Later, French efforts at aggression were made from western or Diamian side, despite an agreement concluded with France in 1890 respecting the northern frontier. In conclusion, if a man's idea 6,000 nautical miles away in 16th century, in 18th century London, with no internet, aeroplane, and modern communication devices, ultimately morphed to Nigeria. Imagine what you can ideate for the good of Nigerians and your personal economic gains. And that, that's it on the show tonight. I am Bola Oba. Have a good night.